Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast by Bangalore International Centre, bringing you conversations that move, inform and encourage discourse. The plastic chair, which also you see on, you know, anywhere from a doctor's waiting room. You see them in museums here. You see them in any sort of social gatherings. They've replaced a lot of the sort of earlier common mudas or the common sort of benches that you would see in, say, street side cafes and things like that. And in their sort of ubiquitousness, you'll notice that they have a power. They're almost invisible because they're sort of so omnipresent. It's something that you don't even notice. You don't see the, you don't even feel the incongruity of a plastic chair at the National Gallery of Modern Art, for instance. Are you sitting down? Have you thought of what you are sitting on? What your favorite chair's history is? Why do certain seats make us feel a certain way and make us gravitate towards them in a room? A whole spectrum of history, design, culture, discipline, identities, object study and geographical context are often located in the various kinds of seating that we now may not necessarily be aware of. To remedy this, in this episode of BIC Talks, designer and independent researcher Nia Tandapani speaks with graphic artist and researcher Sarita Sundar on her newest research project and collection of essays edited by her Beyond the Throne. And now, over to Nia. Great, thank you Leka. Um, and thank you to BIC and thank you very much to Sarita for having me here. I feel very fortunate to have had a little window into this project from the first time um, myself and my co-researchers spoke to Sarita about the project and then seeing some of the work in progress talks and the sort of more recent window that I've had into the book and how that's developing itself. So I'm very excited about this project and I thought that we can begin with a question about starting points. I'm interested in why seats. Was there a particular seat that you started with, a particular concept? Um, and what sort of boundaries did you create around the project? Thanks again, Nia, for being uh, sort of uh, facilitating this conversation. And the project actually started around 2015. It started as an essay, which looked at the story of seats in India. It was um, against the backdrop of a museum studies sort of assignment. And I think as a result of that, the tone of this entire project has taken on a sort of a cultural history sort of uh, lens and um, has actually meandered in and out of the design history territory. In that sense, there's some sort of an anthropological sort of leaning in the sense of looking at objects as a means to understand culture. Uh, just to sort of quote from Arjun Apadurai, the Indo Indian American anthropologist, where, who says that, you know, to follow the things themselves for the meanings are inscribed in their forms, their uses, their trajectories. So in a sense, in doing so, I may have made some sort of unreasonable links and have gone down sort of futile paths, equated design foliage patterns on the back of a chair with the incoherence of the creators, sometimes invested in arguments on the provenance of the details we find in the seats that surround us. Uh, but I hope I've also sought out uh, some sort of a creative salvation in the clever curve that I've discovered on one seat and the possibility of rebellion against existing structure in a gracefully resolved motif in another. So in a sense, you know, looking for meanings in the things that surround us, in the legs and arms of things, in trunks of elephant lions, and in the jaws of mystical beasts. Would you like to give a overview of the, the scope of the project? The project, in a sense, didn't start with the seats themselves. They, it actually started with these 
overarching theme, so to speak. And then what what happened is that I found that some seats fit into certain broad themes, some seats fit into three different categories altogether. So that's how the sort of the book is structured as well. There are eight sort of core essays which starts with looking at the vernacular seat, which means that seats that have existed and have been part of the last couple of thousand odd years, so to speak, in some form or the other. So those are seats that helped in ceremonies, in rituals, they are seats that conveyed a sense of hierarchy. A lot of them are floor seats or near floor seats. And then there's a sort of transition to the colonial seat, which looks at the fusion of elements between the Indian motives, Indian sort of materials with Western motives and Western sort of technologies and things like that, mostly during the 15th to the 19th century or so. And then after that, that sort of moves on to notions of power and posture and privilege that a particular seat could engender, which would range from, say, the thrones, looking a lot into the peacock throne and the possibility that a throne could create ideas that were sort of larger, mythical, almost sometimes as in the case of the peacock throne, when it was represented in miniature paintings, there was a sort of a simulacrum that was created because there was this notion of an imagined power that surrounded the peacock throne. But going on in that same chapter, for instance, I look at the plastic seat, which again is sort of talked about in a chapter that just looks at the very, very ordinary plastic seat, the modas, the charpais and such like. And then going on to sort of ideas of sort of modernism in India and how the Western style modernism versus say more regional modernism, which was sort of birthed, which was very, very contextual and the sort of relationship between the two. And then to the present day where there have been attempts to sort of create seats that were either in some way inspired from the past, but at the same time resisted any uh, notions of what existed prior to that. Ideas also of how ways in which the contemporary seats have attempted to address various notions of sort of sustainability of material, sustainability of employment, of communities. That's a sort of a large gamut that the eight core essays have a take. But in addition, there are three contributions, one by Lakshmi Subramaniam, who sort of speaks of the range of Godrej seats in detail. She was a, a research scholar with the Godrej archives two years back. Sujata Shankar Kumar speaks of her uh, sort of experience as a furniture designer at NID and the pedagogy that sort of existed and still exists to an extent. And um, Abigail McGowan, who sort of looks at the interiors of early to mid-century Bombay. So that's a sort of the large sort of breadth of what you'll see in the book and what we are also planning to do is to have an online version of just 100 seats of India, which would just sort of allow you to see short biographies of 100 seats. I wonder how you define the seats in the book. It strikes me that there's a sort of complexity to the way that we use the word seat in comparison to perhaps how we use the word chair. But then there's seats that are almost like beds. You've got the charpoy and the chaise lounge. Then there's modas and sort of seating aids, which I know that you address in the book as well. So, yeah, I'm interested in, in kind of how do you define the seat um, within your project and also why a seat and not a chair? So I think what had happened is that when you look at the idea of the chair, the chair in its sort of present form did come into India maybe around the 15th 
century or so. And what's interesting is that the, the term for a chair in the north of India is kursi, which comes from the Arabic word. And in South India, it's uh, casella, or at least in, in Malayalam, it's casella, which comes from the Portuguese cadera. While it's, while it's a fact that that particular form possibly came in the 15th century, there have always been various sort of aids to seating in India. And there have also been elevated forms of seating in India, whether it was the throne or the muda. But what was actually more curious was to sort of look into the the various forms of vernacular seats that exist in India. And if you look at, say, uh, you know, you were mentioning the aids to seating. So, for instance, the Dichan Yu, which is from Gujarat, are these little small pillars that you can put under your knees when you're sitting cross-legged. Or, for the, for instance, the Yoga Patta, which you again see uh, in, say, used by deities. So you see Lord Ayapa using it. It's a sort of a cloth band that holds your knees together, again, when you're sitting cross-legged. So I, I found that the notion that only a chair can actually assist in sort of seating a bit limited, given the fact that there's, there's this range of sort of different forms of seating in India, which have existed uh, right from the palagya or the pira, which is just a small sort of rectangular piece of wood that's raised a couple of inches ab above the ground, you know, sort of to protect yourself from the cold or the heat or the damp floor beneath you. So uh, in that sense, the exploration into the seat meant that the chair was just one of the various sort of seats that we looked at. Uh, it's also curious that there's the chair is also called Nalukalige, which means four-legged one in uh, Telugu as well as in Tamils, which I found kind of interesting that there was a need to sort of define uh, this particular seat, that is the chair, as something that had four legs, as opposed to other forms of seats, which necessarily did not have either legs or did not have four legs, for that matter. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's a there's an example later on in the book of a seat with one leg as well. <laughs> yes, that's uh, Sandeep's sort of one-legged exploration, I think. Is that the one that you're referring to? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. In, throughout this project, I've kind of heard you speak on a number of occasions about your grandfather's chair. And, and the dedication in this book is to MP Ranjan. And, and there's an image of his, his chair there as well. And you talk about his place in the history of the seat in India. So I'm interested in how the aspect of the personal has come into this piece of what is a historical work and why these became such important touch points to, to the point where they were eventually featured within the text itself rather than just being starting points. I think uh, what's, what had happened is that my interest in sort of material culture studies possibly started with the manner in which my grandfather connected to the material objects that he owned. There was also this realization that there's a lot of sort of tacit knowledge that's surrounding an object. And my interest has always been to sort of try and to seek out what that knowledge was. There was always, there's always been this sort of struggle of being an insider and an outsider when I used to say visit my grandfather in Kerala. And as someone who would sort of come and visit the village occasionally, there were a lot of things in the objects that surrounded him or the village or the house that had meanings which I couldn't entirely understand and the people around me did. So there was also this sort of tension between what's formally studied versus what's tacitly known. And in a sense, I think that that sort of also has led to looking at things that are everyday, but at the same time sort of being charmed by the myth, myths around them. So I could possibly read a small piece from the book, which uh, is a short passage that I start off with. It goes like this. And um, 
throughout the book, I have used some amount of sort of anecdotal tableaus, so to speak, to to enter into the larger themes that are uh, the concerns in the book. Uh, this particular one goes like this. It was the dignity and loftiness with which my grandfather assumed his seat that drew me and most of the village to his side over and over again. The chair upon which he sat, upon which he spent most of his day, was a standard issue teak and canvas seat. Every morning, a fresh white muslin towel was laid out. Every morning, he would pick it up, shake it out, use it to swat the chair assiduously, stretch it as if to ensure symmetry, and lay it down with utmost precision before assuming his position on the veranda. It was a station of vantage and power, angled as it was to command a view of any approaches to the house or of any emerging from within. His percipience and his reputation for astute advice saw villagers seeking his darshan or counsel often. They were afforded positions determined by their social standing across from him on seats much like his, benches with backs, benches without backs, stools, or none at all, where the more confident found spots on the inner or outer steps and the less stood diffidently in the compound. On days when he was occupied elsewhere, just the presence of the simple seat imparted the comfort of continuity, the reassurance of his gentle authority, and the conciliatory rhythm of routine. When he passed, the chair was folded and stored permanently. The void on the, vera on the veranda echoed across the village. So I, I kind of felt that there was not really a day that I could sit on my grandfather's charu kasala or the sort of the uh, reclining chair without looking over my shoulder. Somehow I was always uh, deeply aware that I did not quite fit the seat, that I had not earned the privilege. And I think it was my grandfather's appreciations of the things that defined him and by which his acquaintances remembered him that kind of triggered my interest in material culture and objects to sort of ferret out why they take the shape they do, who conceived them to be this way or that, and what gave these things agency and why. Yeah, I think that, that sort of idea of the personal is in itself kind of another source. And I'm always interested in other researchers' sources, and particularly in a project like this, where the scope is so wide, but also where presumably a lot of the sort of archival material that we often rely on as research was not available for certain objects. There's, of course, the Godridge archives themselves, which I know forms a significant source for the project. But what about other sources which were not in the form of a traditional archive? What about the objects themselves? I'm, you know, I'm interested in to what extent, for example, more sort of ubiquitous objects like the monoblock or the plastic armchair is kind of a, a source in itself and, it's, and it's, it's everywhere as well. The sources for this project have been quite varied. The Godridge archives have been a sort of a starting point as well as a number of institutional archives. For instance, the National Institute of Designs, archive, the library, the Knowledge Center archives, the uh, CEPT archives in Ahmedabad have uh, provided a lot of sort of content. But other than that, most of the material and the content for this project have come from personal conversations with designers. Some of it has been from personal archives of people. Some of the interviews with some of the sort of seminal individuals who've sort of played a seminal role in uh, design history of chairs in India have really informed the book. I've been fortunate enough to have uh, interviewed people like Mini Boga of Taru from Delhi, Upadhyay from NID, and and I think a lot of those sort of conversations have led have have sort of shown light into some areas that couldn't possibly have been found out in any sort of institutional archives. The other thing that has sort of informed the book has been personal archives. And for instance, as an example, there was this image that uh, a friend and industrial designer, Kaushik Ramanathan, sent me an image when I sort of asked him about the one of the Godred chairs that he uses. 
uh, the CH13 chair. It's a sort of a swivel chair used in mid 20th century, uh, which he had sort of revived, changed the springs off and uses it in his studio in Goa. And when I asked him about it and where he got it from, he sent across this image. And it's an image of a collection of chairs uh, in a factory in Mysore. And there was something about that image. And I, I, I think I lived with that image for a while, for a long time. I kept sort of going back in, back to it. And, um, and that actually became the starting point of this idea that factories such as these were, in a sense, the digs of uh, modernism in India, because they were places where there were these chairs that were discarded and designers such as him or other sort of even design historians, you yourself have sort of uh, accessed or purchased chairs from the NGF in Bangalore. And I found there was something to be said about the fact that mid-century sort of modern furniture was seeing a sort of a revival. I could sort of read out a small sort of portion which describes that image. Uh, so it goes like this. In the middle of the dilapidated factory floor, a family of chairs sit in circular conference. Despite various stages of disrepair, these chairs with their painted frames, white plastic cane seats and backs, and synergy of proportions betray their kinship. Pulled from a tangle of rusty green and gray metal, remnants of machines not dissimilar from the ones that produced them, they, stu they stand estranged from the tables and other office paraphernalia they were once surely teamed with, appearing tentative, lonely, and unsure. So to me, actually, what happened was that spaces such as these, these sort of abandoned factories and antique stores and back alleys had become the digs of the archaeology of modernism. They were either discovered by chance or resolutely disinterned by auction houses, antique dealers or personal collectors. And that sort of, you know, started off this inquiry about can objects with a history of barely 70 years be called a vintage? Can they be antique? Can they be collectible? What makes objects that are neither of great material value and often not even particularly well finished, such as the case of these sort of chairs, by contemporary standards at least, enjoy such great demand after relatively shorter bars? Why and how do even reproductions of modern masters earn and retain an aura? So is there a value, a sort of a consequence is it because of their value or a consequence of their association with design, architectural or cultural history? It's something that I think comes up in a number of different ways throughout the book is modernism and what you refer to as sort of neo-modernism in how it's kind of being translated into contemporary design. Is there a connection between this idea of sort of looking to the past for examples of, of good design that we see people like William Morris and, and kind of colonial officers in India sort of pulling at, at these sort of notions of, of a crafting tradition and sort of antiquity. Is there a link there between that idea of revivalism and the way in which we are seeing revivalism or, or the idea of a design revival and particularly I think a, a modernist design revival happening now? I think the, the the first sort of revival that one saw in India, like you say, was sort of in the late 19th century with the sort of interest in, say, some of the furniture that came in from along with the British colonial sort of uh, colonials. For instance, the Sheraton chair in particular, where certain forms were sort of adopted into by Indian carpenters. However, with a fair amount of sort of uh, introduction of Indian motives uh, overlaying it. And yet there was this interest to sort of create something that was formally fairly minimal. There was an interest to create a certain unity of sort of expression, a certain elegance in, in the way in which, say, certain Say, say the leg of a chair, for instance, the, the, th the turn that it would take in, say, a Sheraton sort of leg. 
uh, th those were sort of adopted into the language. There was a sort of turning away from too much of a celebration of of ornamentation and things like that. But what happens today in, or at least in in the twenty first century, I think, has been a different sort of a revival and a relook at creating. Uh, seats that are in some way drawn from history. Uh, so there is, say, a motif from a craft tradition, but at the same time, there's also a need to keep to uh, the formal language of mid-century sort of modernism as it was seen in the West, as opposed to, say, a form of sort of regional modernism that was already being introduced in, say, places like in Shantiniketan which actually looked at creating contextual sort of objects, objects that, um, or, or, or that, that were more concerned with, say, creating employment or reviving a certain craft tradition. So that was a completely different idea of modernism that was introduced in, say, Shantiniketan. And even for that matter, even at the Bauhaus school, which actually celebrated the handcrafted and things like that. So there was, a, I think, at some point, there was a sense that the sort of social ideology that was surrounded early modernism, which had to do with creating products for the masses, that sort of ideology, in a sense, has, has lost its way, so to speak. So in a sense, uh, I think the, what, what is, what's happening today is that the social program that's associated with modernism has been abandoned. And today what you see is the juxtaposition of words like modernism with a capital M alongside words such as luxurious and exclusive, which becomes a sort of rhetoric of new designs, uh, even using words such as rustic elegance and a return to the in inverted commas, primitive, that these sort of new products proclaim to project. They seem to be somewhat tented with appropriation, with an element of elitism, connoisseurship. And actually, instead of inexpensive mass productions, many of these designs actually promote high quality craftsmanship instead of every man's products. They are exclusive. And instead of the assurance of egalitarianism, is the promise of elitism. So in that sense, I think design expressions in the 21st century have oscillated between these purposeful sort of lunges towards modernism, but as, at the same time, nostalgic flirtations with the old, you know, either adopting the stark and regimented sort of dictums of mid 19th century modern classics or embracing the frugal simplicity or ornateness of crafts. So in a sense, again, uh, you know, as they, they seem to be almost pastiches of various sort of design styles kind of coming together. And they're kind of looking backwards and forwards and forwards and backwards in this dizzying sort of indecisive decisiveness. There's this sense that there's, you know, that object life spines only last until the next new thing sort of arrives. And... Um, uh, kind of resonating with what Victor Papanek, who was an advocate for such social and sustainable practices, said about uh, these dark twins of styling and obsolescence. I think in the book, you sort of highlight modernism's kind of moment in India or a particular moment of modernism in India with, with these ideas of kind of citadels of modernism in Chandigarh and at NID um, and with Godridge. And what you pinpoint as neo-modernism and returning to and drawing from a kind of modernist aesthetic and form. But I'm interested whether you think there has been a modernist revival in India. And if so, who's been setting those terms for that revival? When something like the CH chair, the Godridge chair, the Cantilever chair, that's that's kind of quite iconic now and is in something that you focus on in the book. As far as I'm aware, the Godridge chair has been in continuous production since um, the 1950s, I think, when it was produced. Actually, even earlier. It was in the 19, late, early 1930s was when the first sort of the steel furniture was introduced and specifically chairs actually was introduced. So, 
bearing in mind this con continuous production of iconic pieces of modernism in India. And on top of that, continuous use of modernist furniture in places like um, schools and government offices. How do we define a modernist revival? Is it to do with use or is it to do with appreciation? And whose appreciation are we, are we kind of identifying? If you were sort of just to sort of define what makes an object sort of modernist, there, there, you can define it in a number of ways. So is it sort of the ideas of Western style modernism, which would mean mass produced furniture or, or any object, which then because of the very nature of mass production means that the cost per piece is sort of uh, manageable for uh, a larger group of people. Do we mean by modernism that it it borrows or or sort of is inspired by things that are immediately around? Is it something that we look back at the idea of modernism as it was defined during the Renaissance period, which meant uh, a definitive sort of search for an egalitarian sort of society and things like that? In that sense, it's very difficult to have a fix as to whether we can say that the, the seats that we're talking about, which is, say, the Godrich uh, CH series of chairs, are the only ones that fit that criteria. Definitely, uh, uh, they, they were created as a response by the newly independent uh, state to meet the needs of a nation, meet the needs of sort of the needs of a, a, an increasing middle class. And they were created in these factories, which were called the temples of New India, so to speak. But uh, now the reason why those have been revived have, has very little to do with the actual reason why they came to being in the first place. In my mind, uh, the interest in sort of reviving some of those mid-century sort of classics, so to speak, are have more to do with an interest in a nostalgia which is driven by a language, a visual language, what is sometimes called let retro and things like that. So in that sense, I believe that those chairs when they are sort of re-looked at today, are more sort of reinterpretations, but with a nostalgic lens. Uh, not so much with an understanding or an appreciation of why these seats were created in the first place. The way that I've been sort of thinking about it recently is the distance that we were able to create from history and a kind of amount that we sort of want to know about the objects versus what we think we would like to know. And I, I, a term that keeps coming up in the work that we're doing, which I'm really starting to uh, get fed up of hearing is patina. So a lot of dealers will talk about the patina of an object that can actually be a physical part of an object. But what they mean is this general, often very vague sense of history. I think that ties into the sort of nostalgia that we have for objects. What I think we sort of lose in that sometimes an actual understanding of the sort of full histories of those objects. So, you know, we, we like this idea of sort of utilitarian aesthetic, but the history of utility is invisible. Just to give you an example, when I visited uh, an antique store here in uh, Bangalore, which was attempting to uh, sort of bring down some of the Chandika chairs that you're sort of interested in as well. There was a great deal of uh, care being taken to ensure that the authenticity of these objects remained intact. So that means that they were mended, you know, just enough. The wood surfaces were not rubbed to a shiny polish. Uh, the white paint that was peeling off in parts from the label was not touched up. So in a sense, all these sort of, you know, the, these seats had these administrative labels and codes, as you know, you know, 
li for library backslash 101 or something like that and all these sort of administrative codes which were very crudely just painted on onto the teak wood were kept and in their very distressed form so in a sense they they were sort of these proud reminders of their authenticity and the sort of place that they played in the bureaucratic sort of history of uh, Chandigarh. So, and all this was looked at very, very carefully to ensure that these marks remained so that they could stand apart from the reproductions of these very chairs, which were then finished extremely well. In fact, the reproductions had better design details, you know, uh, because um, we've become cleverer at the way in which we understand how to use joinery and things like that. We've got better sort of minimal hardware and things like that. But at the same time, there, there are these reproductions of the chairs on one hand, and then you have what's the authentic chairs, which remain, which, which continue to sort of show the marks of their age, all the patina that you're talking about, the distressed look and things like that. <laughs> I think there's also been this sort of a global trend towards nostalgia all around and, uh, you know, a certain yearning for the comfort and uh, stability that the past could possibly offer, you know, a sort of an un antidote to the uncertainty of what we face around us. So it, it's not just in furniture design, but design across various disciplines have attempted to sort of ferret out forms from the past not just from the past, sometimes the the repositories that they're looking at are from, yes, from ancient culture, but also from popular culture. For instance, the ordinary and the everyday. You know, when we were, when you were talking about the Muda, for instance, I was saying that the very, very banality of an object such as that, the fact that they're they don't have, they're anonymous, in, or at least uh, do not have an attribution, they're not generally they're fairly context free they're not uh, they don't belong to a particular geography or a particular even period of history somehow those are very easy canvases on which today's design can be built upon mm -hmm. and i find that a lot of contemporary designers have say for instance attempted to redesign the muda or redesign the charpai because there's this sense that these are forms that have stood the test of time. They can be used in a variety of ways. They're very, very flexible. But at the same time, there's a desire to put on an imprint over them, an imprint of either a personal expression of a designer or an imprint of a particular, um, say, technology or a stylistic sort of curiosity that is specific to, to, to the today. So for instance, uh, there would be maybe a new form of a leg for a charpai. And that is, it retains the form of the charpai, but there is a sense that today's technology can bring another sort of a leg or another sort of a weave or another sort of a fiber. And maybe 30 years later, when someone else sort of reinterprets the charpai, there would be an imprint of that period, maybe. And the book itself is sort of geographically and historically framed within India. And this idea of sort of context or kind of rootedness comes up um, several times throughout the book. So I'm, I'm interested in generally, and maybe we can come to Chandigarh specifically, whether you feel an object like a seat in this case can have a nationality or a national uh, or a sort of national identity. I mean, there are seats that are very, very linked to a particular geography. There are seats that are linked to an individual and seats that are linked to a particular period in history. So you can say that a particular form of a muda is is connected to the sort of crafts, the sort of weaves, the sort of cane that's available in the northeast of India, which would be separate from, say, a moda that's made in, in the west of India. There is also the sense that 
a particular seat belongs to a, an individual. So, for instance, my grandfather's chair was my grandfather's chair. Sort of sitting on it would mean that I'm sitting on my grandfather's chair. <laughs> and um, Or, for instance, the peacock throne was sort of so closely linked with, with Shah Jahan and all that he embodied, the empire itself. And even if there have been versions of the peacock throne, that have been that were made a good 200 years after Shah Jahan died. There was an attempt to hold on to uh, the myth that surrounded the original peacock throne and the hope that any sort of peacock throne would therefore carry with it the the grandeur, the allure that was associated with Shah Jahan's sort of empire itself. In that sense whether India has a particular seat, it's very difficult to sort of say that there is one particular seat for a particular nation because it's obvious that we are sort of so diverse. Um, but at the same time, we've had sort of various seats in various po uh, points in history, at various in across various geographies that have been iconic to that place and sense of time. So you have, say, Sankheda chairs, which are these uh, turned wood um, chairs from Gujarat, which are even today used for marriage ceremonies when they're held all the way across in America. Um, and they are transported there. They play a huge role in a religious ceremony, marriage, or birth ceremonies. And um, and they are sort of iconic and help carry a sense of community identity with them versus maybe uh, something that's very specific to a, a craft tradition. So you have the Kishangarh chairs, which are these folded chairs, which are very, very specific to an area in Rajasthan. Again, they have a particular craft tradition associated with it. So I think maybe not a sense of national identity, but def definitely a sense of some sort of a geographical or cultural identity and even historical identity very closely linked with uh, a lot of these chairs. So for instance, the, the chairs that emerged as a fusion, as the fusion that sort of happened during the colonial period, we have very, very definitive sort of Indo-Portuguese chairs that were these folding chairs that you still see today in in Goa. And they had a distinct identity. They were folding because they were used by the Portuguese, by the well-to-do Portuguese uh, uh, to carry to the church so that they could sit on these separate chairs away not and not on the church pews. Uh, and those have continued this sort of Portuguese sort of uh, language uh, in terms of, say, the foliage that was used. The Dutch, the Indo-Dutch sort of language was different. The acanthus leaf that sort of came again was sort of a borrowed Western motif that that sort of fused with uh, a gajasimha's trunk or a makara's jaw. And somehow they all sort of came together and formed this transnational identity for that period of time, at least, you know. Of course, your project isn't Indian seats. It's the seat in India. And I think that that's a really important distinction. And the Chandigarh chairs continue to be really important because they sort of highlight the risks of this as well. And this sort of pull to own the history of a seat and to own a design moment and what we see with the Chandigarh chairs is them being featured in auctions called Swiss design when they have this long and really important history in, in Chandigarh itself. Definitely. I think this, this question of attribution of a seat, uh, the notion of who owns it mm -hmm. and, and not just sort of owns it in terms of, say, the, the design rights or things like that, but even in terms of like what you're saying, the sort of the idea of is the Chandigarh chair 
a Chandigarh chair or is it a sort of mid-century modern designer's chair? It's very, and I think to a large extent, and I have to admit that I've been guilty of being swayed by the the, the sort of narrative that surrounds the idea that Pierre Genere was is attributed to being the the sole designer for the designs of the Chandigarh chair, while actual sort of archival ed- evidence, or at least a certain amount of sort of anecdotal evidence, does point to the fact that there have been other designers, uh, both other European designers, as well as Indian sort of architects and designers who and craftsmen who would have played a very, very critical role in creating these sort of designs. And um, to an extent, I have to say that I have skewed the narrative a little bit, in a sense, without intending to, of sort of giving a sense that Jean Array, with his sort of love of India and wanting to have his ashes thrown into the lake of Chandigarh, it was an it was something that I, I think I got caught up and in that sense sort of skewed that narrative that way. But getting back to the sort of question that you've asked about attribution itself, I think one is the sort of question of whether a, a, a chair or a seat uh, belongs to a country or a city such as the Chandigarh chairs, or whether it, uh, how much is credit or attribution given to the creators of a chair is something that is always been a bit problematic, and particularly I think in India. As an example, Upadhyay, who was who's considered the father of furniture design in India, who designed a whole lot of furniture for Taru the Taru studio, again, mid-century modern designs from Delhi, started by Mining Boga. The fact remains that a lot of the chairs that he designed uh, no longer carry in any way the memory of the fact that he was the creator. And present-day carpenters still create reproductions of these chairs. And if you inquire about where these designs come from, they'll say that they're Taru designs and not necessarily can form the link to the fact that it was designed by this iconic designer in India who even today remains fairly unknown amongst the young designers or in the popular sort of sentiments or narratives of that surround furniture design in India. And I, I kind of wonder whether one could trace that idea of anonymity uh, that surrounds who's the creator to the idea that in India itself, a lot of iconic creations, whether it's temples, have never, have never sort of advertised, so to speak, the creator's name. So it's very rare for you to know who has designed a particular temple, or who's the master architect. You would know the patrons behind it in in the form of some sort of uh, inscription that's hidden somewhere in a temple, which says that so-and-so has contributed X amount of tolas of gold or money or whatever else at that point. You may have uh, the name sort of scratched somewhere, but in most cases it's not. I'm not saying there's a sort of connection to that or even condoning in any way the fact that it, or excusing, so to speak, the reason why some of these, why there isn't an emphasis given to the sort of the original creator of a piece of work. For me, this highlights is this idea of kind of authorship, particularly in design, being more than the designer. So this idea of sort of patronage can be thought about in terms of of ownership and authorship of design. There's a designer, of course, which is something that I think now we're very, very aware of. But I think what this also highlights is more problematic side of that in terms of labor and that authorship of design and who's designed it and who's made it is all part of how we can think about authorship of design. And so opening up to a fuller notion of what authorship can can include seems to me uh, a good way to 
acknowledge the labor that's gone into the design process as well. Thinking about your book, for example, in the wide scope of seats that are included, I think craft and knowledge and, and actually historically who, who, who had that knowledge and, and did that craft as part of it as well. Let's take Chandigarh as an example, the carpentry and the production line and the people whose hours and work went into the production of chairs. I mean, something that we often talk about in our research is the, the difference in the sort of smaller differences in the same model chair and those differences being introduced by the people who are making the chair. I think, yeah, I think we sort of uh, seem to miss out on those sort of details when we look at the, it's almost like there are these broad sketches and those broad sketches are the ones that we focus on and not so much on the sort of specifics of, of say, formal language, of craftsmanship that a particular object actually is in, endowed with, so to speak, you know. And I think, I do feel today there is a bit more of a recognition of the role that craftsmanship plays. Uh, there is a little bit more of an acknowledgement of that. And in that sense, again, a lot of the uh, designs that you see today, which I, I kind of call reflexive and romantic, do give a lot of credence to the role of partners who've come in and the uh, the role of a contextual sort of a community who are involved in the creation of a particular piece. I think it's a sort of a positive that's that I see and it's possibly only in the last 20, 25 years that I see that sort of acknowledgement of the larger context against which piece of design is created, the people, the community, the sort of the long history that it has been sometimes a part of. I think the Godridge archive, which is a really important archive for this for this book, you know, is, is quite unusual in its sort of scale and scope. And I'm interested in what that gave you. The iconic Goldrich chair, which is the, within the Goldrich archives, they refer to it as the S-shaped S chair, though it's not really S-shaped, uh, the tubular CH4 to CH8, really, because there are versions of it. It is the ubiquitous sort of office chair. It's been around. It is being sort of phased out. They aren't anymore being produced in Goldrich, actually. There was always a sort of curiosity as to the origins of its of the design of the chair, and um, the first thing that one did was to sort of look through the archives itself and sort of look through the immense sort of catalogues that are there. What the Godridge Archives actually offers is a lot of correspondence that they have what they call circulars, which would go out. They were the early catalogs, which would sort of say that, uh, you know, the CH4 chair is available in tubular sort of sections of such and such sort of diameter, uh, available with wooden sort of uh, armrests or without. And there was this sort of curiosity to sort of find out when did it come, how did it come, and... Um, for me, there was this moment when I saw that uh, Marcel Brewer's Seska chair was part of the catalog that came along with the Design Today in America and Europe exhibition that traveled for two years all across India, uh, late 1950s, early 1960s, as part of this arrangement with between the American government and the Indian government. The intention of the exhibition really was to introduce to India ideas of design that as they existed in the West, ideas of production as they existed in the West. And, um, and there was that, a brief moment of excitement when I said, oh, that chair came for the exhibition and that's possibly when the Godrich chair must have sort of taken form. Of course, 
digging through the archives and looking through the circulars proved me wrong. So that moment of excitement was very, very brief and short-lived because we found that the chair that we're talking about actually did get produced in the early 1930s itself in the Godrich factories. The Seska chair was designed in the 1920s. So is there a possibility that someone traveled to Europe, came back with an image of the chair, came back with an actual chair, used it as a reference? We don't really know. So there is a certain sort of mystery and a sense of a sort of uh, uh, digging through, to use the word that I've used before, the uh, you know, the archaeology of modernism, so to speak, which exists even within the archives of institutions or companies such as Godrich. Sometimes you'll get a vignette of a lead that you want to sort of follow through. And sometimes you just hit a sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a huge wall and you can't sort of go any further. And trying to sort of piece together between the NID archives and then the Godrich archives, looking at the MoMA archives as well, the Museum of Modern Art, who actually sort of uh, brought the exhibition into India, looking through certain documents that are available within even the government archives, which sort of have letters that were exchanged. Those sort of together piece a story together of this notion that a certain language of Western style sort of modernism uh, was d definitively introduced to India as part of sort of the Cold War cultural diplomacy that happened during the period. And I think it's, it's very difficult to piece together that history solely from one archive. So it had to be a combination of all of these together and sort of see whether there's a thread of narrative that you can put together between all of these three or four that, and all to find out whether this particular chair came and where did it come from? Was it an inspiration directly from Marcel Brewer's Seska chair? Was there any sort of link between the Vasili chair, as some people have discussed, and even sort of connections to sort of um, the uh, MR chair as well. So there's a sort of uh, question mark that I think remains. We haven't found anything yet very, very definitive in the archives that point to that connection, however much I might have wanted to make this direct line of <laughs> uh, connection, yeah. The MoMA exhibition, the other three exhibitions that happened not too far time-wise from the MoMA exhibition, they're a kind of important point in, in that chapter of the book. Do you want to say anything more about those exhibitions? Um, there were a lot of exhibitions that happened after the MoMA exhibition, which were after the creation of sort of NID being set up, which were again connections between India and America, specifically between there were exhibitions that happened in the UK, there were exhibitions that happened in the USSR. But the ones that we are sort of concerned about in the Citadels of Modernism chapter are these sort of four. The first, of course, is the 1919 exhibition that happened in Calcutta, where the Bajos artists actually were invited and brought in their art. What was interesting there was that there was a synergy of sort of thought between the initial ideas of the Bajos and with the uh, philosophy that Shantiniketan started off with. What is also curious is that the interest that they shared, which was a celebration of craft, in fact, um, Gropius actually uses the word India Gothic in his address uh, during the setting up of the Bajos, uh, referring really to sort of a nod towards craftsmanship that India obviously was known for and celebrated for at that period in history. What is also interesting is that 15, 20 years later, the language that Bajos sort of follows moves away from craftsmanship, uh, hand craftsmanship to a sort of a more mass-produced style, and that then 
goes on to becoming the modernist sort of idiom, so to speak. Um, the second exhibition, which happened again, brought uh, notions of what modernist interior architecture would be through the form of this uh, ideal home exhibition that was held in the 1930s in, in Bombay. The third then was the exhibition that was held in uh, New York itself, where a lot of the, that was in the 19, late 1950s, where NID, the people who eventually came to create the manifesto, so to speak, for NID, which is the Eames report, the India report, met with other cultural stalwarts at that time, the Sarabais and Pupuljekar and things like that. And the fourth is what we are talking about, which actually brought, which was sort of part of the cultural diplomacy programs that happened during that period, intention to sort of introduce ideas of sort of industrialization, designed sort of products and things like that to India. And the fact that it traveled to about uh, 11 cities, I think, in India is something that it's been very difficult to find documentation around that. You know, which were the cities, where were they held? I haven't yet sort of found that out. I'm hoping to find that out in the next project that will happen as a follow up on this. Uh, the more specifics of where it went, how long it went, and things like that. In your project, how does labor fit into this? It's, you know, it's framed within design, but in terms of production, craft, labor, where does that come into this sort of scope of the history of the seat in India? Going back to sort of what Ranjan had sort of called out is the use of materials that are sustainable for once, for instance, bamboo specifically, and his the rallying cry that he made, Katlamara Chalo, Katlamara being a small sort of place in Nagaland and where he worked with a bamboo craftsmen and introduced furniture to them. Most of them were using bamboo primarily for uh, housing or for household products not so much safe for furniture. That cry was also intended not just to sort of address issues of sustainability of, of craft itself, but also specifically things like sustainability of communities, of designing objects, understanding ways of making, and uh, in a sense also ecological sort of issues, definite, definitely, but also to address really the sort of imbalances that have existed between, say, craftsmen and designer, between local uh, users, local creators, as well as sort of global consumers. So I think the particular chapter that addresses this, which is called uh, Journeys into sort of spiritual aesthetics and things like that, addresses these issues. And it talks about a style which is in some sense a sort of a political stance. It's also a, there's a definite sort of sustainable ethic and aesthetics that's associated with it. And it extols sort of simple forms, roughly hewn materials. It celebrates those forms and materials itself. In contrast to this is the monoblock chair and the white plastic chair, which features in a number of chapters in the book. Where do they connect and where do they depart? The sort of seats that are part of what I call spiritual modernism, you know, things like the Baitak, the Muda, the sort of redefined Charpai, the Muda chairs and things like that, they have been historically sort of embraced both by royalty as well as commoners. And uh, they do run counter to factory produced objects or products. They also run counter to actually highly ornate and expensive craft objects, which again would mean that they would only be used by people who can afford that level of sort of time, effort and skill that, is, that are usually associated with highly ornate objects. So these products that I'm talking about, that is the products that are part of 
spiritual modernism or alternate modernism, they actually share a very strong relationship with the environment. They're made of natural and inexpensive materials. Amongst their patrons, you have sort of, yes, designers, you have social influencers who go beyond sort of the stylistic and superficial, and they actually embrace simplicity as a philosophy, as a definitive philosophy. They also are very, very key and hold, are part of this sort of aesthetic that upholds a conviction in the dignity of human labor and the life of craftsmen. And a lot of those objects you'll see on the streets, but you'll also see them in a sort of an interior which wants to proclaim that sort of philosophy. And running counter to that really is the plastic chair, which also you see on, you know, anywhere from a waiting room of a, a, a doctor's waiting room. You see them in museums here. You see them in any sort of social gatherings. They've replaced a lot of the sort of earlier common modas or the common sort of benches that you would see in, say, street side cafes and things like that. And in their sort of ubiquitousness, you notice that they have a power. They're almost invisible because they're sort of so omnipresent. It's something that you don't even notice. You don't see the, you don't even feel the incongruity of a plastic chair at the National Gallery of Modern Art, for instance. For me, the sort of discovery and that particular chapter, which is called Poetry in the Common and Everyday, which features to a very large part the plastic chair, I, I was sort of hugely informed by the a lot of images that I found on social media, on sort of Instagram, by both professional photographers as well as sort of casual photographers who somehow saw a charm in this, in the poetry, in the common and everyday. You would see the plastic chair in factory sheds, you'd see them Bollywood backlots, uh, you'd see them on the street. And the manner in which that they were photographed were sometimes because they formed such a stark juxtaposition against the backdrops against which they were. For instance, museums, sometimes very, very ornate architectural backgrounds and stuff like that. Sometimes because they almost seem to have a certain herd-like quality. They sort of travel together. You'd see them in, you know, being carried at the back of a cycle. You'd see them sort of having almost a party in a garden. And I found that we've come to accept this object as something. We, we don't always question whether it sort of hurts our sensibilities or what it's doing in terms of both the visual impact or even, you know, where are all these plastic chairs going to go? You know, those sort of questions are things that we, we just don't ask ourselves because they've, they're very useful, they're extremely comfortable, and uh, they're adaptable. And I think there's a huge amount of learning to be made from from just that. The fact that they are so ubiquitous, the fact that they are they can be transported, that they're used in, you know, the hallowed halls of museums and, and by the common I'm curious man as well. If you think that beyond social media where we're seeing this kind of interest and, and sort of visual interest in the plastic chair. Are we going to see a revival for the plastic chair? Can there be a sort of nostalgia for that in the same way that we've seen for some of the, the sort of mid-century modern classics that you've pulled out in the books? Or is there something different about the plastic chair that means we won't see that? One would think that the coldness of steel that's associated with, say, some of the mid-century sort of modernist Indian icons, for instance, the CH4 series of Godrej chairs, would not sort of inspire a nostalgia, but it has, right? I mean, 
if we were to sort of go back in time and sort of think of the 1950s and say that, you know, this chair that was everywhere, it's still, you'll still see the remnants of the CH4 series in some of the government offices, though they're fast being replaced by classic sort of swivel chairs of today. You think that at that point in history, you'd say, oh no, there's no way that this would become something like an icon. So in that sense, it's likely that the plastic chair would also see some sort of a revival of sorts or a revival of interest of sorts at some point. For now, I know for a fact that there have been attempts by manufacturers even in India, and I've spoken to the one of the biggest sort of manufacturers in India, that's the Neil Kamal Industries, and they've said that they've very consciously tried to incorporate motifs that would appeal to a certain sort of communities. You know, they've incorporated floral motifs to bring a certain amount of warmth. They no longer then become monoblock chairs strictly because what they do is they remove the back panel and that's sort of slotted back in. And that bit then is the one that's supposed to be contextual. So they've attempted to sort of make the chairs look wood like they've attempted to, well, mimic weaves and things like that. So there's an attempt to sort of make the plastic chair not so plastic looking. And I know that, uh, for instance, when I was speaking to uh, a designer based in Bombay, his name is Ajay Shah, whose work I've sort of featured in the last chapter of my book, He's he said that I am itching to sort of design a plastic chair for India. Mm -hmm you know, in a manner that it would be more contextual to India. What it would mean, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think he was referring to just sort of superficial surface level treatments. But he said, that's, some, that's a challenge and that's something I would love to do. He wasn't actually very specific about the plastic chair, but he says a mass produced chair that was uniquely an Indian chair. When I ask, is there going to be a revival of the plastic chair? Well, it's already ubiquitous. It's already in production. It's being used. Can you revive something? What does it mean when you're looking at something that actually exists and is ubiquitous and is everywhere? Yeah, it sort of goes back to, I forget who'd, who'd said this, but do we really need another design of a chair? <laughs> Don't we have enough? I don't think that's so. There can always be a better design or something that's more relevant or something that's more needed for the present day and the present way of living and things like that. There'll always be, I think, cleverer answers and clever solutions because inherently, you know, most, uh, you know, designers or man humankind is intended to solve problems and stuff as we go on creating new problems. <laughs> so, Who is it that's saying that we need more chairs? Like often it's designers that are saying that we need more chairs. Who is it that's saying that we're having a sort of modernist revival? It's designers that are looking at something which is actually ubiquitous for most people and saying that we can think about this in a new way or we can reimagine this. And I mean, you know, it's you designers sitting here having this conversation as well. So I think it sort of touches on that. I don't know, I think for me it touches on coming back to what we were saying earlier about distance maybe that we create, the way that we kind of dislocate ideas and nostalgia for objects from actual use and sort of reality of, of sort of objects and history of objects. I'm curious to see whether we truly have a completely new interpretation but I think the way some people or some designers are sort of are approaching the idea of seating is interesting, which is not entirely looking at the seat as just its physical form, looking at material sort of inspirations, but actually looking at things like the gait and the posture and the sort of relationship that the body has with the objects that surround us, you know, so how do we interact with an object. So what is the way in which the body engages with an object? And it's not just sort of the posture of seating, but the way in which the body sort of 
not just sits on something, but also sort of in in various way engages with an object itself. There's gait and the way in which your hands move and things like that. All that sort of yeah. relationship is comes to play, I think. One of the things that excited me in the books is the sort of intersections of this project and the idea of sort of objects and design histories, but with things like as you're describing now, sort of economics and and movement, but also one of the things that comes up in the book is is dress and the idea that this sort of intersects with dress history and the the idea of what kind of clothing may you be wearing to sit comfortably on a certain seat and how, as seats change, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that dress changes. And so these kind of ways in which histories like this kind of intersect is sort of interesting to me. It's a very curious point. And there's this scene in, a, in the very well-known uh, Lawrence of Arabia, where you have the character in question. Lawrence is sitting with his sort of superior in royal tent, which is furnished in a sense, Spartan, but very luxuriously because they've got carpets on the ground and things like that. There's no furniture. People are all sitting on carpets. The Europeans are sitting in their uniforms very, very uncomfortably, while the um, Arab and prince is sort of wearing flowing robes and he's obviously very, very comfortable. That particular scene is iconic because you can see the discomfort and you can see Gandhi also sort of, in some way, deliberately adopted clothing in a, in a very, very deliberate political manner by discarding his sort of Western suits for the dhoti, by discarding the chair and sitting on the ground. It was a deliberate political sort of commentary and expression. Therefore, when visitors would come to meet him, they were distinctly uncomfortable and at a disadvantage because they were in their Western sort of attire while Gandhi on the ground was very, very comfortable. So it's kind of interesting how there is this sort of connection between clothing and seats you wouldn't. What do objects like seating do beyond their sort of functional purpose and how do they kind of force a position or sort of force a pose I think that comes up in the book in terms of gender as well and in terms of Gandhi and... The presumption that uh, an elevated seat meant that there was progress or it was a more civilized sort of manner of conducting yourself while the fact remains that culturally, ergonomically, if you consider health, sometimes it's possibly not the best thing to be sitting on, you know. (laughs) The rigidity that the chair imposes on us should surely sort of tell us that it's not necessarily more civilized thing to be doing. Or healthy. I think that if there's anything that sort of office culture and, and sort of office seating has told us about that, it's that often chairs are really bad for us. that force motion upon us. So, so for instance, Godrej has a motion chair. It just by, it forces you to sort of, the nature of sitting on it forces a motion upon you. So it's almost like we've created the problem and then we try to solve the problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think one of the things a lot of researchers will talk about is this idea of sort of for the future folder, this, this place that when you're doing research you found lots of things that are very exciting very interesting but actually aren't actually relevant or meaningful for the project at hand so I am interested to know in this project what would be in that folder what 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 else is there what what else have you come across and and what more are you thinking of doing with the, the work that you've started in any project of this nature there's one bit which is the rabbit hole like research that one gets drawn into or fallen (laughs) you fall into in a sense and then there's the sort of big picture narrative that you feel has a lot of missing threads for me that has meant sort of two things that i hope will happen and there are two folders (laughs) 
<laughs> that that have sort of emerged as a result of this project. One of them is actually looking at this idea of sort of threading these intersectional design histories between India and America. I see a lot of moments in those sort of milestones that actually provoked a lot of things that are very, very critical to Indian design histories. There's a search that's going to happen in that project. The other is a very, very deep down sort of look at the planter's chair and its sort of representations. And hopefully I might be getting into doing that alongside uh, another researcher as well. Uh, is there any one seat that that now still stands out? Is there a favorite seat for you in this project? It's kind of difficult to sort of say that there's a favorite seat, but I could say that one that does stand out and I keep going back to is present-day designer Sandeep Sangaru's range of Kashmir chairs. He's addressed a number of concerns. You know, you can't really say that it's a postmodern sort of style or a new modern style. He works very closely with craftsmen. He does tackle a lot of the real problems that craftsmen sort of face. Uh, so there is sustainability of the crafts, of the material, of the production methods, of skills itself. There's also a sort of sustainability of relationships, which I find of great interest. Uh, there's this Lucknowi term called Ganga Jamuna Tezib, which is sort of reflective of the synchrest syncretity, I have to say that, syncretic nature of crafts as they've existed in India. So the sort of number of diverse communities that come together to create a, a craft form. So he addresses all that within this, uh, a lot of his work, and in particular with the, um, the Kashmir chairs. Three different forms that the chairs take. One of them is inspired by the chinar, which is a maple tree, the chinar leaf. One that's seems to be, at least to me, inspired just by the earth, you know, like the mottled earth, so to speak. And the third from the architecture, the sort of walls of the mosques that exist in Kashmir and things like that. So there's a sort of a range of influences there. And they're subtly sort of embedded into the seats themselves. The visual language is such that I think it doesn't really fit into a particular category. Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. If you liked what you heard, please share it with family and friends. You can also leave us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible are Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S. Sarvanaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman of Chris Cross Design Studios. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter to get regular updates on our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.